Welcome everyone. Today we have the wonderful Lisa Meister joining us. Lisa is a courageous survivor of SRA and mind control and she is the author of Only God Rescued Me, My Journey from Satanic Ritual Abuse and You Have the Wrong Guy. So today Lisa speaks out to expose the evils of the enemy's kingdom and she shares survivor stories on her podcast Only God Rescued Me. Lisa is a fierce warrior for survivors and she shares brilliant information on how to navigate the healing process and just to de-trigger daily life. Um, She shares powerful tips for both survivors and supporters on things like surviving all the symbols of the Easter weekends and how to respond when a friend discloses abuse. So in one of her recent shares, Lisa wrote a blog article about the answers she received when she was asking survivors what happened when you didn't get out of your SRA family quick enough. And I just thought it is such a brilliant brilliant article and so very timely as we have just so many new survivors remembering at this stage and navigating the early years. And it is, it's just such tough times. Like it's, it's one part of it is the the memories, but it's also just re-evaluating and looking at every relationship in your life and just, you know, ex- assessing it um, in terms of, you know, is this person an abuser? Were they involved? Do they know? Are they conscious? Are they programmed? And, you know, the whole the whole process for survivors just means our whole lives are they're turned upside down and inside out and just getting to safety realizing what is safe and what isn't can be just really very very challenging um and it can also be quite isolating so I thought this would be such a great topic for us to just catch up and unpack together and and just have a general chat because um Lisa has many survivors that she supports in her community and you know likewise it, this this area is um you know, an area that I hear come up so often for survivors as just a challenge. They're just not too sure where to start, what's going on. Um, And it is, it's, it's almost, it's probably one of the hardest areas for me to watch because I'll often see survivors just starting to remember and you get so excited as well as you, you know, wanting to support them. And you have a family member, a handler, someone from that, that survivor's life earlier on just reach out and get in that survivor's ear and put them back into denial just be like your family would never do that and it's yeah it's it's such a it's such a complex area so welcome Lisa how are you wonderful thank you for having me I was so excited when you reached out because I am so passionate about this topic I I put this out on my site and just the responses and the parts that just small paragraphs. I mean, it was paragraph after paragraph after paragraph as they were telling their stories and it just broke my heart reading them. And so let's learn from it. Unfortunately, it's, I I wish there was a rule book that we could follow, but these, the cult generational families have a rule book and they follow them and we're survivors and we're just waking up to repression and dissociation. And like, I don't know what happened to me. I can't believe this happened to me. Did this happen to me? Oh, I don't know if it happened to me. No, it didn't happen to me. And our mind is all over the place. These little flashes of things are happening, not even a full story, right? Just little bits of rituals. So I can't even tell you how I got there. I can't tell you how I, I don't know who was involved. They all had hoods on who, you know, was it my mom? Was it my dad? Was it my grandparents? I don't, you know, we don't have those answers. And so we can't begin to evaluate anything, but the people that were involved have their rule book and they are following it to the T. And so we're very vulnerable. And that's what's scary about this. 
It really is. It's so true, isn't it? It's um, The cults have such a way of working and programming survivors. And I think, you know, the hard thing for us is we're only just starting to put those pieces together, where, whereas the, this knowledge that they've been using has been passed down for generations, for thousands of years, and it's really set up. But one thing I'm finding is, you know, as we connect the dots as survivors, we can start to see patterns. Uh, so, you know, the way they try and handle and pull one survivor back into the cults or shut them down from remembering, it's very likely that another survivor will receive similar treatment. So I think that's why discussing things like we are today, Lisa, is so important. Like it, it's hard to hear, you know, the the awful harassment and things that the cults do. But if we're aware of what they do, we can be better better prepared for it as well. And I just wanted to read out um, a little bit from the start of the article because I just thought you explained this so well about the safety of family members. And Lisa wrote, in most families, the whole family is unsafe. A very few have a parent or maybe both who didn't know. And it might have been grandparents or uncles or the schools or something else that were involved in the SRA. But that is rare. So usually it is the whole family and the last person that the survivor realises is unsafe is the mum because that is the biggest blow. The survivor doesn't want to lose his or her only family uh, and SRA is very, very much not understood. So you really can't explain why a Luciferian family is dangerous. So just wow, and I think it's so true, the for survivors processing um the part that their mothers have played within you know the network can be one of the hardest things and I know I know for myself um you know that was something that took me months and in my situation my mother was a slave um However, I had to actually go through and process all the time she'd been used under programming to traumatise me in abandonment traumas, et cetera. So even though she might not have been conscious of the abuse and playing a leading role like some of the other family members, you know, I still had to basically fathom that my mum's not safe. She, she still has that programming there. So, you know, she could potentially trigger me. She could potentially be handled herself um, and be used to trigger me in some way. So it's not, um, it's, it's a really hard thing for people to work through because I think in the, um, our programming, so often we have like this good cop, bad cop, you know, good, good person, bad person set up. And, you know, we have one abuser and, you know, another person that's programmed within the family bouncing you between them. So you hate this person more and then run to the other not realising that, you know, at the very least, even if they're not an abuser and not conscious of what they're doing, they're still programmed, right? So they're still going to have so many things set up, um, you know, and it could be just things like poverty programming or bad relationships or, you know, being abusive, being jealous, being judgmental. Like these are all things that really affect um affect children as well. So, yeah, I, I would love to hear, you know, what you found about, survivors working through just healing and identifying you know the, the the mother wound which is such a such a deep part of the programming that they they manipulate the mom is the hardest one because our need to have that mom love us no matter what is so deep inside of us that we hold on to that after we we have to let everybody go and it's so painful and to have to let her go too is the hardest piece. So survivor after survivor after survivor that I listen to, they're like, oh no, it wasn't my mom, not my mom, not my mom. One, one woman told me, but my mom dropped me off, but she didn't realize what was going on. She didn't know what they were gonna do. And then later she had a memory of her mom in the group as well. So she dropped her off to make it look like she, you know, didn't know what they were doing. She's like, I'm sure she just needed the money for rent. You know, she had all the reasons why it could have been okay in some way, shape or form. But then later realized that she was actually there in the group. Now, when I went to my dad to tell him, I remember 
what you did. My mom was there. My husband was there, their pastor, my pastor. And I said, I remember SRA. And he was mocking me. And he says, the next thing you're going to say is that your mother was involved. Now, that was interesting because I didn't bring her up. You know, it's like in all these years, it's like he was he was waiting because he said that because he thought I knew back then I didn't know. I, you know, all this stuff was new, it was just coming out, but he was waiting for me to say, well, yes, she was, so he could make me look bad, but she was involved, right? So it was part of the games and the tricks that they play and the whole thing. But I think it's rare for the mom to not be involved. I think there are times when they're not, but there's certainly the majority of the time that this they're working together. Now, I do know some women who have contacted me when they find out their husband was involved. And for some women, they were drugged. They find out that they were drugged. You know, it's like, I I always slept. I'd go to bed at night. All of a sudden it was eight o'clock in the morning. I, you know, I never understood how I always slept through the night. And then they realized that there was drugging involved. So there's, there are circumstances where that does happen, which is very interesting, but The letting go of the mom is usually the last step of healing, the last step of accepting the whole story, what they see. And usually there's a flashback that's going to hit where they actually see their mom there. Mm -hmm. And that's towards the end of the healing process. And it's, it's a blow when they get that one. It is, I think it's one of the harder pieces to get. There's just something about your mom. She carried you. She's the one that's supposed to protect you. And if everybody else in the world is against you, your mom is, you know, supposed to be the mother bear. She's going to put herself between you and whatever, because that's the way God created it to be. It's just, it's sad. It is. It's such a hard one for survivors to heal through and recognize. And I think it makes so much sense that that's the last piece that falls because often the male abusers and programmers are the first memories. Um, and I think potentially that's because maybe they're the more violent um, things that the survivor has been involved in, but it's probably also the emotional protection, you know, our minds just can't fathom that the mother, the mother has been involved. And I think what you mentioned about the drugging is, you know, it really makes sense. And I would say that that would reflect a lot in my family situation, and it was really hard for me to to see that, you know, in rituals and in events that I was being used in, you know, this person, my mum, was there, even though she was completely out of it and drugged, et cetera. That actually hurt me seeing her in those events more than more than some of the abusers because I already knew, I'd already processed that they were evil, they were, you know, just whatever. But to even just have that person present and being forced to watch what was going on under drugging, that was like so heartbreaking. And I can see how for survivors that's protected so much. And you know, we have to be aware that within the, the cult networks, like their whole um, setup is such an inversion of what God's plan is for humanity too. So within the networks, often the women can be very powerful. Like I know a lot of survivors where the women, uh, the the wives, the mothers, the grandmothers were actually, you know, the mothers of darkness, the witches, they were more highly ranked than the men and they were actually controlling everything uh, more so than, than the men, which can be a real surprise in some families as um as survivors, you know, wake up. So I think We've just got to be so careful during the remembering process. And if you're not sure, you don't have memories about a mother and, you know, auntie figures and females in the family, I think for survivors a really good you know, protection is just be careful while you're remembering of what you speak to, like if you're still in contact with those females, be careful about what you reveal, you know, you're remembering until you're ready to make it public to everyone because like what I've noticed with survivors is quite often the females that seem less threatening in in the family um, or, you know, they're not immediately perceived as abusers have been used as, as handlers and info gatherers. And they may be conscious of it or not. Do you know what I mean? Like they might just be listening to your conversation and then go talk to 
another family member or their psychologist, but what you're saying to your mother or your grandmother or your auntie who you think is not involved in the family is going to the network and then you're putting yourself at risk because they know what you've remembered and they can can handle you potentially as well. So then the question is, what do you look for Mm -hmm. when you have family members? Because you want to keep people that are safe, but you want to get rid of the ones that aren't because, well, first let's look at what happened to the people that kept in the family too long. And, Mm -hmm. and so let's look at what they said. It's hard to hear, but it's important. So some of the things that they said was, one woman said, they said, I didn't have a right to live. And this woman tried to commit suicide 17 times. One said, they never believed me. So whatever she disclosed, it was, you know, put down. I did what I was told, even when it hurt me and my children. Wow. I was bullied. It hindered me from getting towards Jesus. It hindered my healing. It kept me programmed. Any member of the family I did try to keep told my parents everything. So that's a big, that's a big problem. If I didn't cut off contact, I would be dead. And this is the one that gets me the worst. They hurt my kids. So kids then go through the SRA as well. And it's so common as well, Lisa, right? And that's a tough one because our kids get ritually abused as well. And that's the one that gets me every time. Because if we can't get out fast enough, we can't get them out. And it, you know, there's only so fast we can get our memories. There's only so fast we can figure this out. And that's tough. That's really tough. Um, this one's a hard one. They convinced my kids that my memories weren't real. And it's so common. So common. And that's yeah. what could be more heartbreaking, you know, whether whether it's your children or your husband or, or wife. Losing, yeah. Losing confidence in what you're saying. Um, you yeah. Know, for a survivor, just remembering it is just the most heartbreaking thing. And it's part of the, them trying to isolate you to take away your support and resources too. And remember that, uh, I mean, these are women that stuck with the truth. Yeah. And a lot of people fold. They just fold. I always think that too, Lisa. I just think for every survivor that we have, get out how many just start to get their memories because it is a process like it's going to take you a few years to even really start getting a bit of a picture of what was going on in your family like how many get a memory start to you know break through a little bit there and then get handled and just get taken taken back in oh that's not true yeah that that you're just that's just a bad dream your family would never do that um, and and yeah. they just, for whatever reason, maybe their will's just not there. They don't, you know, as a mind control slave, like how hard is it for you to say no, like when you're right at the beginning, do you know what I mean? Like, so yeah. I just wonder how yeah. many, um begin to remember and just unfortunately get taken back in. Right. I don't know. It's tough. I got re-ritualized and re-trafficked. That happens a lot. lot. They turned my husband against me. Very common. They, yeah, they access programming in me through family that I thought were still safe. Exactly what we were just talking about, right? Yep. They acted nice, so it put me in denial. That's a tough one. They can play parts so well. So well, 
they tried to break up my family. They put me in a mental hospital. That one you hear a lot, it's, a lot. It's just awful. They put me on antipsychotic meds. And they turned my entire extended family against me. And that's what my dad did. He immediately called a family meeting. And I got hate mail from aunts and uncles and grandparents. It was terrible. And for a survivor, you know, for a survivor that's just remembering and dealing with these violent, abusive, you know, SRA memories where you're just like, is this even real? Like this is just off the planet kind of stuff that's coming through. And then you start getting harassed and just physical violence and abuse from family members. You know, it's just another layer. It's awful. And it's it's so strategic as well because they know that if they can you know, threaten us, if they can put us into denial, if they can, you know, make us go into fear, for example, we can't heal. And that's going to potentially stop new memories coming through. Um, and it gives them more, more of a chance that you're going to go, oh, this is just too hard. I'm just going to go back to sleep. They're all good. They're all good. I'm going to go back to my old life and just, just head straight back into it because it's too hard. It's, it's just so strategic what they do. Yeah. And remember, each one of these were pouring out long stories and I just bullet pointed them. And I get like each one of these is a whole book that they could write. Absolutely. Just the horrific, horrific stories. And then they go into, you know, the, the, as they try to go now and live the life with the destruction that their families put into play in their own lives trying to have a cohesive family system now with, you know, the dynamite that they, you know, blew up with their husband, with their kids, you know, th that's tough. That's tough to go forward with. It's tough. It's hard. So the, the quicker that you can understand how this works, the quicker we can start looking at each family member and, and kind of some of the clues of what to start looking for, the better. And to understand that if you have to lose everybody, it's better to go alone than to have this, this laundry list. Because you could have this laundry list. Absolutely. And we don't want that for you. It's, it's kind of like, do you want to be in an abusive marriage? Or is it better to be safe and not be bruised and bloodied or be terrified for your life every day? You know, God wants us to be in a place of peace and to be able to lie down and sleep at night, wake up refreshed in the morning and to, you know, to be satisfied with years, which I believe means that we can enjoy the life that he's given us. And we can't, if we have to keep dealing with his family with this Luciferian roots to it. So true. And it's, it's so hard for survivors, you know, to, to make that choice, to choose potentially being alone, isolating themselves, cutting so many family members off to be safe. Um, but I think, you know, we have to remind ourselves that everything you've known up until remembering was a lie like it's, there's so much programming in there there's so many masked people there's so many people pretending to be things that they're not um so it's just that choice of like you know do you want to keep living a lie you know whatever it was um you know and I think sometimes just focusing on what God has in store for us like no matter what your family has done no matter you know what sort of programming and abuse and all of the things and all of the you know the issues that they've, they've put into your life, you know, God has another plan and His plan is far superior. So once you start cutting off and just breaking these family curses off of your life and off of your you know, your children and your marriage, you can go forward and have you know this incredible life that you probably never even dreamed was possible. So it's hard. It is so hard, but it is so worth it as well and I hear that so much from from survivors once they get through it yeah absolutely so I you know like so what do you look for mm. this, so that's the first thing 
if somebody is in any contact with the abuser, I don't think you should be in contact with them. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, that's just not going to be safe because there's going to be information that they're going to be giving back and forth. Yeah. It's just going to happen. You don't want your abuser getting any information because anything that they get, then they can also send information back. And you don't want them sending code words and anything that can touch programming off in you. Sure. So for an example, I had a friend whose dad died recently. I did a podcast on her, Kate, you can look up. And her mom, so she was having a Zoom call with the dad as he was dying, and she was reading scripture to her dad over the phone. And her mom was programming her through the phone. Mm -hmm. And another survivor walked in on it. And her mom was saying, you will forget as the friend was walking in and, and my Kate was saying, I will forget and forgot whatever the programming was that just went on. And she was suicidal. She had this, she wanted to go back to home. Like I called her, she was at Sonic and she was in a part. And I said, okay, we need you to go home. She goes, I don't know where home is. I'm like, and she was hundreds of miles away from where I was. So I'm like, do you have your GPS? And she goes, oh, yes, I do. I said, is there a home on there? Yes, it is. I said, good, push home. How many miles is it? 2,000 miles, wrong home. <laughs> Don't go there. You no, know? Yeah. And because it was that go home programming. She was reprogrammed through her mom because her mom knew the words, the codes, and she was able to access her. They can send those words, those codes through other people. Tell your sister, and it could be something innocuous, and the other person can send it through to you without knowing what it is. It That's could be a Bible verse. You know, it could be a random saying. It could be a number. You don't know what it is. So any communication that's coming through any member of the family is dangerous. I think it's it's um, really good that you pointed out it can be done over phone because a lot of people are like, oh, I can only be programmed if it's in person, and that's not true. And the same goes for texts, emails. Like we're talking all communication because the code word that you've been programmed with is going to work on everything. Yeah, it's yeah. dangerous. And you get in a program and it's you're going to go home, you're going to go back to the cult, you're going to try to commit suicide, a self-harm. I mean, you don't know what all the programs are. It's not good. And it could even be somebody who's on your side and they're passing things to you they may not even know. So if they're in contact and they're trying to just be an intermediary trying to get you guys to whatever that makes them then not a safe person absolutely and I think that's what we have to realize is that everyone within a family is going to have some sort of programming so they might not be an abuser as such but you know they they might not realize for example like you were saying that they're passing on a message that has codes because they're still under some mind control themselves like they, they can't fully see the picture like if you're if there's anyone in your family that can't recognize completely that it is a cult group they're still under some form of programming basically to different extents right. yeah also if it's somebody that just wants to talk to you to ask you questions what's going on what are you remembering you know, well, who's your therapist? Like they just are interviewing you. Like they're not sharing information about their life. Yeah. That's a really big red flag. That they're not invested in you. They're just getting information out of you. They're not somebody that's safe. If there's somebody that cares about you, then they're going to be, you know, hey, it's so-and-so, you know, this just happened to me. 
you want to go out for coffee? Let's go spend time. And there's going to be a back and forth information going. They're not just wanting to find out the latest thing that's going on with you, right? It's going to be a real relationship and you'll know what that is. But if they're a handler, then they're just wanting information out of you. So I had an aunt that had stayed in contact with me for a long time. And then I realized the only time I heard from her was when she saw on Facebook that one of my kids was getting married or somebody was having a baby and she wondered how big's the baby, who, you know, when is it like all excited. But then I realized I never heard from her when any of that was going on in her family. And it like, Took me a long time to figure that out. But I'm like, all of a sudden, not so willing to take those calls anymore because she's reporting back to my, because I cut everybody off but that one aunt. And it's like, okay, now I'm not so stupid anymore, you know, because I thought I could keep one aunt. Just one, right? And I think that's what we yeah. get to be like, oh, just, you know, just one. They're okay. Just I haven't one. had a memory of them. But they can still be being used. I think that's so important what you're saying as well. Yeah. Because we want to hold on to something. Because, like, I felt like I married my husband and I lost I lost everything. I lost my family. I lost my past. I, lo- You know, like, I just got absorbed into his life. And I don't exist anymore. You know, it's like I started the year we got married and... Wow. It, it's, it's, you know, it's this, it's that same for all of us, but so you try to hold on to something and we can't afford to do that. So true. And I think, yeah, I think because you're literally, as you're remembering, you're having to let go and cut off so very much. This is where we can get stuck is, you know, we're like, oh yeah, I just need to keep this one, one part of my past, this one, this one person and, you know, as well as the family, like another um, important area to to consider is it's not just going to be blood family members, but if you've had family friends, you know, teachers, like, because the, the family is going to have had control of potentially most of the in- institutions that you've had contact with as a child growing up. So you have to also look at communities of schools, churches, sporting, um, you know, so all of a sudden, like these family friends and people from your past, you can't just be, okay, this is someone I can talk to and this is someone I can can ask about my family and what they remember. You, you definitely can and it can be a good um, way to gather some, some info, but just be aware that they could be liaised with, you know, your family and also reporting back to them on exactly what you're revealing to them as well so yeah it's not just family members there these these cults just have such so many tentacles that reach out that's painful it's it's very painful and and there's so much like even family heirlooms um dolls because they can even program you with those sorts of things like purging everything from your past. I mean, we really just want a fresh start. So true. And I've had a lot of survivors have heirlooms of jewelry that was passed down and it was actually cursed. Like they had deliverance and it made such a big difference to their healing, to their home. And it even meant that they had new memories come through. So there were things like, um, I don't remember now, I think it was like earrings, that were basically so they wouldn't hear um, hear from God. And, and it, it's just like things to stop them from remembering. And you don't know because you might not have the memory of that programming yet what that jewellery was about. And I think because it's jewellery, we're sort of like, oh, I should keep it. It's gold or whatever. Get rid of it. I've gotten rid like, of everything that any abuser or, you know, anyone from my family has given me is, is cleared out of my house. And wow. It took me years, like, because there was things I just didn't see. And I think, I honestly think that's because there was a spell over them. I just couldn't find them. And then I was like, oh, how have I not seen this so many times? But wow, once you get all that stuff out of your home, it is just, it's so good. So good. Yeah. Yeah. I had this Raggedy Ann doll that went everywhere with me. I lived with her. I mean, she was everything. And, um, 
had lost her in all the moves we had had. And then I finally found her just before my memory started. And it's like, oh, my raggedy Anne. And I picked her up and put her to my heart, just like I always had when I was a child. And like all these memories started coming towards me and I screamed and threw her to the ground. And my husband stared at me. <laughs> and we both looked at the ground, like what just happened? And he said, what was that? And I'm like, I have no idea. And then he said, if she could talk, what would she say to you? And I'm like, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Put her away. But I am sure that I was programmed with her. Yeah. You know, so like I got rid of her. I got rid of every doll I had. I got rid of every book I had. I have no family Bibles. I have no family jewelry. You name it, it is gone. Cookbooks gone. There is nothing, no handwriting of my family, no pictures of my family, my wedding album, all of the pictures with my family is gone. I mean, there is nothing, nothing of them. And because of this, because we have to protect ourselves, but we have to protect our husbands. We have to protect our children because they will, in, they will injure us if we don't. That is unfortunately such, that is such a good point lisa and i think that can be something that survivors pull on as well is if you don't make these clear boundaries and cut cut all ties to the, the family you know it's not just you that they will come after they can come after your children they can come after friends as well you know i've experienced that um and they can come after you know your husbands and and wives and you know, potentially they can become targets of reprogramming and and rituals. So, you know, even because it can be so hard as a survivor when you're still healing through breaking the programming, et cetera, to stand up for yourself. You know, sometimes I find for survivors, if you think about what the, the family could do to the people you love, that can kind of just give you that strength and that grit, like, no, like you've done it to me, but you're not touched. Like this is a line I'm drawing. You are not crossing. You're not getting to the kids. You're not getting to my partner. Like this is this is done. Do you know what I mean? Um, Absolutely. There's so much, um, you know, with these families, there's so much programming. They pull in like the denial programming, the guilt programming. Like they'll make you feel so guilty about, oh, wh why aren't you coming to see us? And like we know we've got the satanic ritual Easter weekend coming up. Like there'll be so many survivors that their families will be trying to get them to come along. Oh, it's, it's a fair, we never get together. This is, you know, a family event and they'll be guilt tripping so many people to get them to those family events, which will become reprogramming opportunities for them as well. So it's, it's such a, such a process of just identifying every area of the, of your life that they try and come in and handle and, and and basically infiltrate, try and take control of again. And yeah, I would love to ask what you found, Lisa, like in terms of um what's worked for survivors, because you had these amazing, you know, and heartbreaking stories of what the what the networks have done to to survivors. But obviously, because they were giving you these stories, they stay free. So yay. Um, like what were the things that really worked for them in terms of like putting up the boundaries and, you know, being able to identify abusers and, and keep them out of their lives as such? Was there any um, any sort of themes of like what we could pass on to survivors today of things to consider during the healing process? Big one was move far away. <laughs> I did that. <laughs> yeah. Change states. Yeah. <laughs> change states some said hundreds of miles some said thousands so <laughs> I love the farther the, the better <laughs> I love yeah the time with my partner now and I'm just like I don't think we moved far enough <laughs> oh I know um, we moved yeah as far as we possibly could <laughs> yeah uh take you know kick everybody out yeah. and then take your time figuring out who's safe a lot of times oh, yeah. look for who isn't in any contact with anybody mm -hmm. those are the ones you can add back in 
and you know the black sheep or the family are usually the smart <laughs> ones for a reason right and they and often honestly be the most victimized as well Lisa like I found the black sheeps often in the family have, have been the most heavily abused within the family and then they've kind of woken up somewhat as well so they can be allies yeah uh, talk to other survivors you know make sure you have other people that can help you through it that has a lot to do with helping you stay strong because your family can mess with your head and when you sit there for the holidays when everybody else is out you know you see you walk going by and you see the houses with all the cars and you know your family's together it hurts it's painful or like, um, you know, we're going through family weddings right now, the shame of me not having my family there. And I shouldn't feel shame for it, but I do, you know, and just know that you're, you know, it's, you're doing the right thing. And having other survivors there to walk you through those times is helpful. So get in a survivor community. It's, it really helps to have people that know. Um, you know, when you feel safe around people, you know, listen to that. If there's something inside of you that just feels off with a family member, don't like, I used to tell myself, you're just being judgmental and, and that's not what it is. It's really discernment and learn to listen to your discernment. Something just doesn't feel right. Just run the other direction. Oh, no. Learn to run and ask questions later. That's a really <laughs> good, good thing. Yeah. Learn to stay silent when people ask you questions in your family. You, your family does not need to know what you're doing. Really. If, if they want to get out, then you can help them with their story. They don't need to know yours. Never, ever tell them who you're counseling with. Yeah, good point. Never, because they are litigating crazy in these families. Like when I first started, my mom's like, who's your counselor? Who's your counselor? Who's your counselor? It's like, I'm not telling you who my counselor is. It was crazy. Never, never tell. I've heard of survivors that didn't tell their parents who their counselor was, and then they went into counseling and their parents were sitting on their counselor's couch. Insane, crazy stuff. Wow. So learn to stay silent with your family. Don't tell them. I mean, they're, everything in us wants to because we've been programmed to tell. And so we break that programming by choosing to disobey programming and go to the Lord and help him to unprogram that whole, you know, learning how to unprogram. Uh, or do we find ourselves dissociative around certain people? Mm -hmm. if, if we're losing time around certain people, feel spacey or we're abreacting around certain people, then we know that that's not a person that we're safe around. So we got to pay attention to those signals. Uh, do I feel different after having contact with a family member or a certain person? You know, do I come away, away feeling happy and energized or do I just come away feeling weird? Like the, we were only in contact with my family for about seven years after I got married. But every time my husband and I would come away from any kind of time with them, we were always just heavy. Wow. Like something really bad happened. And my husband's um, mom would even say that there was just always something wrong whenever you were over there. So there's just like this heaviness that comes on you. There's, you're just affected when you're around the wrong people. So a safe family member, you just enjoy being with. Mm -hmm. You're going to have fun with, you know, where you're not going to, uh, like a satanic person, a programmer, that sort of thing, you're going to have a reaction to. I so you're going to feel it. How you pointed out to just be aware of whether you're dissociating um, in, in any way, even if it's just mildly, you're not feeling yourself around a person because it's amazing what our bodies 
can tell us because they know what we have been unable to process yet. So just goes to show how important it is to just not, not um, any red flags you get, make sure you look at them. Like don't just ignore things and think, oh, it's nothing. I think you've just got to really start asking questions during the remembering process. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really listen to yourself. Just give yourself a lot of grace and mercy and you know there's so much that we've learned to just tell ourselves to shut up be quiet just <laughs> fit in <laughs> yeah fit in don't listen you know you're just making things up we got to really start honing in on what we know and listen to it absolutely and I think with your with starting to hone in on what you know is you know, it can be great if you've got someone to to work through that with as in talk to a friend someone that you can pray with or your husband or wife just someone that you can actually be like evaluating different people in your family with because if you can bounce those ideas off someone else I think it can really help su survivors reevaluate people because it can be so hard at the beginning to suddenly go start going through your list of family and just trying to look at them in a different way because there's so much programming. So like you said, Lise, just using um using the resources we have around us in every way. So whether it's you know sending a message to another survivor or you know using using a good friend or using someone you can pray with. And you know, prayer is so important as well. Like you know, praying for discernment over your family members, you know, take it to God. Like if you're just not sure take it to God and just ask for guidance, um, ask for things to be revealed. Like that's definitely helped me so much along the journey is just being like, I just don't know. Like I feel like something is off here, but I've got no evidence. Like God, please just help me. And it's amazing after you pray for things like that, the information that can come through, or you might have a dream or a memory might come through because you've kind of opened yourself up to that. And you know, I would just add as well, when you do start making boundaries with um with family members, I think it's really important for survivors to be aware that they're not going to be happy about it. So I think you need to, you know, when you start clearing up your life, clearing your bloodline and, and creating boundaries as a survivor, which will generally be for the first time in your life, you're like, this is my life and that's your stuff. Um, be aware they're not going to be happy about it. So, you know, even just writing down or just thinking about possible responses, um, whether it's going to be retaliation, attacks, smear, public smearing, um, it could be could be witchcraft, it could be, it could be so many, it could be stalking. I think if you're aware and you've processed that you're probably going to get pushed back from creating a boundary, I think it really gives survivors, you know, the upper hand because then when it happens, you can just go, I knew this was going to happen, get out. Um, you know, and even if, if there's people that you feel are going to come aggressively into your life and handle you, maybe a programmer or an abuser that's just constantly been niggling you and you have to put up a boundary and you want to, you know, being aware of what you're going to say to that person after you put up the boundary and they rock up and they're in your face when you're trying to do your shopping or walk down the street or get to your car. You know, I think if you can be prepared and like be strong, like know that God is standing with you, be prepared, you know, to have those conversations. Like what are you going to say to a handler or a family member after you've cut everyone off? And there might be a few different levels. There might be like the, this is the truth. And there might be the, you know, distant family relative that you're, you're like, um, I'm just taking some time out to, to do some healing, you know, but be prepared for those kind of um, conversations as well. Would you have anything to add to like what, what you would suggest for has worked for boundary building with survivors, Lisa? Yeah, that's a hard one. And it's a painful one. It really is. But be firm. Don't don't second guess yourself. Make your boundaries. Stick to your boundary, and God will help you in that. He's, you know, He is your rock, and He is your fortress. He's a strong tower, and the righteous run into it, and they are saved. So I think if you think of your boundary that way, that He helps you with a strong rock boundary, and that. 
between the two of you, you can do it. And that you will be protected in that strong tower. And and that's how you do it. And it's hard. It's painful. There's, you know, boy, you know, we were, I was litigated. It was, you know, there's hate mail from aunts and cousins. And, you know, I thought it was just a talk between me and my parents. Next thing I know, I'm getting hate. I mean, it was so crazy. Things, they called my pastor, like the next morning, it, like my, my husband's parents, like <laughs> my, my brother sent documents to almost everybody I knew calling me a liar, like pages in like, it was insane. I wasn't ready for it. I had no idea what was going on. It's, you know, so everything's on the table. What can happen? But you just stay in your strong tower, let God deal with it. And you just take it one day at a time. It's like, okay, now I'm dealing with this. Oh, well, now I'm dealing with this. And know that other survivors have too. And so you will get through it. Mm-hmm. And it's better than going to rituals, <laughs> right? And you're keeping your family out of it. And you're not going to go back. And and basically, that's kind of the option. So it's better to face whatever it is that you have to face than to go backwards. Absolutely. As tough as it is, it's like when you think about the the choice, what choice is there to go back into, into that? And I think, you know, for survivors, it's so important that we, we realize like we have God fighting for us and, you know, we have like my advice would be learn spiritual warfare, like learn the tools of spiritual warfare because everything that these networks are doing to enslave us starts on a spiritual level as well. So if you learn how to pray and you can pray against, you know, attacks from them, if you can pray against witchcraft and pray against the programming coming towards you, it's going to really help your healing process, but also pushing back, um, you know, any resistance to the boundaries because you can bet. I mean, I think you've just got a plan that there's going to be ongoing resistance for a while and then it will settle. They'll get to the point generally where they're just like, okay, this one's out. We need to focus our efforts on keeping other people in, et cetera. And you know, for survivors, the, it, it is so hard. It's so hard facing all the lies and the programming and the abuse that we've been through. However, you know, I think God has chosen us to be here at this time and the work that we're doing clearing our bloodlines is so important. Like I can't think of anything more important than making sure our children and future generations aren't dealing with this nonsense. Like it, it just has to stop. And I know, you know there's so many of us that are just like, this is the line. You are not coming past. Like this is ending here. Enough. Back off. And it is so nice to finally be able to say no. Yeah. No. I'm making this boundary and you're not crossing it. It does feel good. It's a difference. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they get mad because they've never been told no by us before. It it is nice. Yeah. And you know, the stand that you take, you know, even if you've got your whole family at times going against you and mocking you and hassling you and, saying that what you're saying is lies, you know, know that what you're doing is God's will and know that you are actually setting an example to other people that are still stuck within it too. So there will be people that are watching you and, you know, there may be parts of them that are just like, I, I would love to be able to do that one day. Look at her go. She's out, you know, so you're taking a stand is not just saving your own bloodline, your children and your husband from this, nonsense but potentially it's creating a pathway for other people you know even other other abusers other programs people within the network so hopefully one day stand up and and walk out as well so let's just let's just pray that there is a massive walk out from these evil evil cults yes that is what's exciting we're coming out we're coming out yeah and it's absolutely it definitely seems like there's just more and more survivors remembering at this time as well Lisa I'm sure you're you're finding that which is really exciting and I think it's because there's so much better information um out there that survivors are yeah able to able to begin remembering and to begin getting out of you know these evil 
evil corrupt bloodlines and, and doing the prayer work and just clearing up their bloodlines completely. And, you know, how exciting to think that these generations to come will be free. They're not, they're no longer yes. going to be sold off, you know, like when, as a survivor, when you start looking back at whatever families have done, like sometimes, you know, we've been owned for six, 10, 12 or more generations by the enemy, you know, imagine the first generation under God, being born under God, devoted to God. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, you know, God is busy. A lot of times people think he's silent, but he is not. He is busy stopping this. And I'm excited. It's like, what's he going to do next? What's he going to do next? So we've got all the people stepping out. Mm -hmm. Now he's, you know, the next part is to get the kids out. Yeah. So how's he going to do that? That's the next piece. So that's going to be exciting. That is exciting. I'm waiting for that one, Lisa. It'll be amazing. That's the next wave. That's um, what we're going for. You know what? Like just seeing the way God moves and, and seeing the deliverance and healing that Jesus is bringing at this time for survivors. Like I, I'm just seeing people move through things that would have taken so much longer um, decades ago and just get through it so quickly. Like it, it, it's literally seeing miracles week on week and don't I'm not I'm not saying it, it is so hard there are tears there's just like I can't do this it's full on but just to see the healing at the same time wow they it, it, it's really beautiful and I just think feel like everything is speeding up um so much like God is really just getting us ready and getting started on on dismantling all this nonsense yeah yeah, it took me 20 years. People are six months in going through what I was at the 18 year mark. And they're like, it's taking me so long. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you're like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's amazing. God, God is just amazing. I love what he's doing. Me too. Me too. It's so exciting. Well, it's been so awesome talking to you, Lisa. Like I, I just love your perspective and I, I thank you for just sharing you know, the things that you've learned that survivors are going through. And I hope that, you know, this is a resource for, you know, many survivors that are just starting to remember at this time and, and wondering, you know, how do they evaluate who's safe and who's not and what do they need to do? And yeah, is there anything else you would like to add before we, we close off? Yeah, it just remember healing is a journey and finding who's on the journey is tough as well. Just make sure it's the safe people on your journey with you. Find the safe people, get them around you. And once you got the right people around you, your journey's going to be good. You'll, you're going to get to the other side. I love that. And I think if we remember, we're never really alone. God is always walking this with us. Jesus is here walking it with this whole journey with us. And I actually, I really loved, and I, I forgot to comment before, I loved your, um, when you were just going through solutions, how you said to actually take everyone out first and then evaluate who to let back in. I think that's such a great perspective. And when we realize that we are not walking this alone, that we are with Jesus. We can do things like that. We can actually just push everyone away for a little while, be with Jesus, pray and heal, and then see who we want to take in. So, yeah, thank you so much for sharing, Lisa. It's um always always a pleasure to catch up with you. And, yeah, I look forward to, to just more survivors, you know, hearing about these ideas of creating boundaries and just, creating the safety they need to heal because they deserve it you know say say no and say yes to yes to life and yes to to going forward in healing wonderful thank you so much gabby you're welcome